Judge McAfee, Fulton County Superior Court. He is releasing his opinion on the disqualification issue, whether Fannie Willis will be disqualified, whether Nathan Wade should be booted from the case, whether the case should be dismissed. This is what the opinion says. From Scott McAfee, the judge. This is the order on the defendants, Ashley Merchant on behalf of Michael Roman and others. Their motion to dismiss the case and to disqualify Fannie Willis, the DA. Judge McAfee takes us back to January 8th. He says, back in January, defendant Michael Roman, represented by Ashley Merchant, we saw, filed a motion to dismiss the indictment and to disqualify Big Fanny Willis. Now, eight co-defendants later joined Mr. Roman and supplemented the motion, raising additional grounds for disqualification. Judge McAfee gives us the breakdown here. All of these people joined in. Trump, Giuliani, Meadows, Clark, Cheely, Schaefer, Floyd, Latham, all on the team. Now, among other allegations of disqualifying conduct, the defense contend that DA Fanny obtained a personal stake in the prosecution of this case by financially benefiting from her romantic affair with Nathan Wade, whom she personally hired to lead the state's team. Now, more specifically, McAfee explains that defendant Michael Roman and Ashley Merchant, they allege that Fanny and Wade, that they traveled together on multiple vacations with Wade, covering many of the associated expenses. Wade was coming out of pocket. Now, Michael Roman later supplemented his motion with receipts from some of these travels, and they admitted to those travels as well. The state responded with an affidavit arguing that Fanny had not received any financial benefit through her relationship with Wade, and that their personal travel expenses were, quote, roughly divided equally. And that was from the Nathan Wade affidavit, where he lied. Okay, so he said the relationship in the same affidavit. So if the judge is taking any of that affidavit as fact or accurate, you know, the reality is, if you believe the actual evidence that existed at this evidentiary hearing, their relationship started before 2022. And that means that affidavit was inaccurate. It was a lie, in other words. But the judge continues. As alleged, the claims from the defense presented a possible financial conflict of interest for Fannie. And more importantly, the defense motions and the state's response created a conflict in the evidence that could only be resolved through an evidentiary hearing. Defense says the relationship started in 2019. Fannie says it started in 2022. They say there's differences of opinions because the affidavit doesn't match the defense evidence. And so they got to lay it all out, which is what we covered. And one that could not simply be ignored without endangering the defendant's constitutional rights to procedural due process. So if Trump then is being prosecuted by Fannie and Wade, who have been indicting each other and Fannie appoints Wade for a conflicted reason so that she can pay him money and then go on cruises, that means that Trump and these other co-defendants, their procedural rights have been violated because there's some other ulterior motive for bringing the charges and they're not getting the same process as the others. Now, after receiving two and a half days of testimony, Judge McAfee continues. He says, during which the defendants were provided an opportunity to subpoena and introduce whatever relevant and material evidence that they could muster. The court finds that the defendants failed to meet their burden, McAfee, of proving that Fannie acquired an actual conflict of interest in this case through her personal relationship and recurring travels with her lead prosecutor. Leaf blower guy just showed up. He's saying hello to everybody. What's up, leaf blower guy in the house? It's gonna be so nice out there, no leaves whatsoever. So Fanny says the judge, this is the big holding, defense failed to meet their burden of proving the DA acquired an actual conflict through her personal relationship and her travels with her lead prosecutor. Now, the other alleged grounds, writes McAfee, for disqualification, including forensic misconduct, are also denied. And so this is an interesting question because this includes the church speech and some of her other prosecutorial misconduct. However, the established record now highlights a significant appearance of impropriety all right, that in affects the current structure of the prosecution team, an appearance that must be removed through the state's selection of one of two options. Fulton County Survivor, season one. The defendant's motions are therefore granted in part. All right, so the status quo will not be maintained. So Fannie and Wade and their little love affair is now getting broken up officially. So let's continue. McAfee says, he writes about an actual conflict of interest. Here's the judge. He says, our highest courts in Georgia consistently remind 
remind us that prosecutors like Big Fanny are held to a unique and exacting professional standard in light of their public responsibility and their power. Every newly minted prosecutor should be instilled with the notion that she seeks justice over convictions and that she may strike hard blows but never foul ones. You're right. Now, most importantly, prosecutors are expected to assume a role beyond a mere advocate for one side, and they must make decisions in the public's interest, not their own personal or political interest. Okay, so it sounds like you're going to disqualify her then, because she was literally sleeping with Nathan Wade and taking trips, grifting off the money that was coming from Fulton County as a result of his appointment that she did. His is a public duty. Fanny represents the entire public, quoting other cases. So recognizing, writes McAfee, that these are not empty slogans, nor toothless admonitions without practical effect, Georgia courts have not hesitated to step in and use their inherent authority to disqualify a state prosecutor when required, especially when that prosecutor labors under an actual conflict of interest. Referencing the Georgia Constitution, saying each court has the power to exercise powers as necessary to effectuate its judgments. And every court has power to control in the furtherance of justice, the power to conduct its officers, and all persons connected with the proceedings in the court. And courts have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted within the ethical standards of the profession. Wow, all this is great case law, like certainly he's going to disqualify her because she's violating all of these things. Lied to everyone in the court. Now, disqualification of a prosecutor, writes McAfee, due to a conflict of interest is thus not a creature of statute, right? There's no laws that really govern it so much as it is a judicial remedy. The courts have the power to administrate what's happening in their courtrooms, recognized by our appellate courts since their formation, generally on the grounds of public policy. They say as the administration of law should be free from all temptation and suspicion. Hmm. Yeah, including, you know, having a craving for a Nathan's hot dog there in Georgia. So far as human agency is capable of accomplishing that object. Bunch of case law being cited. Now the administration of law, he says, and especially that of criminal law, this is a quote that the defense kept pulling up, should be like Caesar's wife, be above suspicion and be free from all temptation, bias, or prejudice. The Georgia Supreme Court, writes McAfee, has most recently denoted conflicts of interest and forensic misconduct as two generally recognized grounds for disqualification. And he asks about this other case. He says, you know, while this other case, McGlynn, while that indicated without citation or further explanation that disqualification allegations require a high standard of proof, neither the Court of Appeals nor any other appellate opinion has provided enlightenment on where exactly the relative, quote, high standard falls on the evidentiary spectrum. The court believes McGlynn offers little, if any, guidance to the analysis at hand. So the judge is kind of getting rid of this case, which is interesting because remember previously here, we talked about the different, the burdens of proof and really the three that we were talking about here was the preponderance of the evidence standard, the clear and convincing evidence standard, and the beyond a reasonable doubt evidentiary standard. And we're familiar with this. So, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, you see in the movies, you know, you know, client needs to be uh, convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. It's criminal trials. It's the highest standard we have. Then we had the one which was the low standard, which is preponderance of the evidence. And that is like 51% is enough. So if it's 51% likely that you did something, they'll say that's enough to find you liable. Then we have clear and convincing evidence. And this was the standard. We weren't real sure, in other words, where the standard was in this case. And the government, Fannie was saying it should be much higher. It should be somewhere up here. And they were referencing this McGlynn case. Now, this is a high standard of proof. Again, that's not like an official standard under the law. So we don't know what that means. And so we're going to see if the judge gives us, you know, articulates where we are on this. But right now, he's dismissing the high standard of proof as at least coming from the McGlynn case. So let's see what he says. Now, a conflict of interest, right, includes acquiring a personal interest or stake in the defendant's conviction. So now we're talking about the elements. It requires a personal stake. Okay, got it. And defines a conflict of interest. What is a conflict? It is a real or seeming incompatibility between one's private interests or one's public or fiduciary duties. Huh, so that seems pretty obvious, right? How about this one? What if Fanny needed to discipline Nathan Wade? Do you think her relationship might conflict with the public duties? In other words, if she needs to fire Nathan Wade because he's not writing his notes down because he keeps everything in his head, is that an appropriate relationship? There's an incompatibility that between them. She wants him coming over at four in the morning to give her the old indictment. But if she scolds him, she won't be indicted, you know? And we have a conflict there. So her public duties conflict specifically with her private interests, which is strange because, you know, the judge is going to say that there's no, I guess she can stay on the case. So he references that clearly law, I think in our favor. And in such circumstances, no showing of prejudice by a defendant is required. Okay. So it's kind of a low standard.
standard. This is so because the prosecutor's duty to the public creates an additional public interest that must remain unconflicted in every criminal case, right? So like the prosecutor is held to a higher standard, right? They should be beyond reproach. They should be like the most sanctified people in the government because they are prosecuting people for other crimes. But a determination, says McAfee, now we ask of whether a prosecutor is laboring, working under a conflict of interest is a fact-driven one. So is there a conflict such that there's a seeming incompatibility between private and public duties? In this case, there was a finding that this is called battle versus state, that there was insufficient evidence of a conflict after they established through testimony the attenuated nature of the connection between the lead prosecutor and the victim's mother. Okay, so prosecutor is prosecuting a defendant. The defendant did something bad, right? Probably, you know, somebody's life ended. Prosecutor represents the victim's mother, has a close relationship with the victim's mother, is saying that person was also employed at the same office. And so this prosecutor was biased because they were too close to the victim. They worked together at the same office. And they said, that's not enough. The prosecutor doesn't have to get off the case for that. There was not enough evidence to say that the prosecutor may have been over animated, overly aggressive, you know, overly emotional because the person who died, the mom worked in his office. Not enough. Now, in this case, says the judge, sort of using that prior case as an example, Nathan Wade's manner of payment is not actionable on its own. Hmm. His manner of payment. Let's see what he means by that. From Fulton County, the billing records, the fact that Fannie Willis was the one who approved the contract that resulted in him getting the contract and the money in the first place. Whenever a private attorney like Wade, says the judge, is paid by the billable hour, a motive exists to extend or prolong the assignment. Huh. This, however, is a tension that the legal profession has long accepted. It is also the type of speculative, quote, status violation that our courts have regularly denied as insufficient grounds for disqualification, absent solid proof of some other conduct. Okay, so there's a ton of other conduct. Like, that's not the only piece of evidence. Let's see where this goes. So he's saying, look, you know, yeah, people bill hourly. So that alone is like not enough, which I would agree. Let's see. Finding wrongdoing cannot be imputed to an attorney based on marital status alone. All right. So now he's saying, oh, it's kind of a status. This feels very like trying to shove square peg in a round hole. Thus, Nathan's oath of office. So Nathan took an oath in combination with the supervision theoretically provided by a neutral and detached Fanny should generally be sufficient to dispel the appearance of that improper incentive. Okay. So the special counsel's oath of office in a normal situation, when you have a neutral and regular, like if it's not Fanny in a perfect world, it's not Nathan. It's just a regular special prosecutor. He takes an oath. You have a non-indicting DA. They're not, you know, jousting each other at four in the morning should generally be sufficient to dispel the appearance of improper incentive. Okay. I would agree. Sure. But nor would a romantic relationship between prosecutors standing alone typically implicate disqualification, assuming neither prosecutor had the ability to pay the other as long as the relationship persisted. Okay. But in combination, as is alleged here by the defense, a prima facie argument arises of financial enrichment and improper motivations, which inevitably and unsurprisingly invites emotion such as this. So the judge is, you know, giving us some clarity here. He's like, well, if you take any one of these things by itself, and I would agree, right? A prosecutor, like in a relationship with another prosecutor doesn't necessarily, you know, I think that happens all the time, probably. I think prosecutors probably meet each other. They're like, you know, hey, I'm miserable. You're miserable. Let's be miserable together, you know, and they, you know, find love or whatever prosecutors do. I don't even know what they do. Do they have love? I don't know. So as to the financial allegations, here's what the court says. The court makes the following factual findings. Let's see if we agree with these. On November 1st, 2021, Fanny hired Wade to serve as the special assistant and lead the investigation that produced the indictment in this case. Fanny considered at least one other option before hiring Wade. And of course that date is true. That's in evidence. DA considered at least one option before hiring Wade, extended an officer, an offer to Roy Barnes, the governor, he declined. And the contract allowed a $250 hourly rate, a relatively low amount by Metro Atlanta standards for an attorney with Wade's year of service and contained a ceiling on the maximum number of hours permitted. But the whole formation of that was very not above board, right? A lot of that money came from COVID money and contained a ceiling on the maximum number of hours. Now, under the terms of the first contract, Wade was not to perform more than 60 hours of work per month without written permission, and no evidence introduced indicates that Wade ever received permission to exceed these monthly caps. Now, his contract was renewed again on November 15th and again on June 12th. And those contract renewal dates, they were in a relationship at that time, right? Especially on this one. They were together.
together. So she renewed her lover, gave him a new contract after the first one expired. Even if you believe that the relationship started, you know, early 2022. Now between October 2022 and May 23, Fannie and Wade traveled together on four occasions that resulted in documentable expenses. I think it was over like six months or something, seven months. Four trips, like six months. The first included an extended trip to October 2022. So definitely in a relationship, right? October. And then she re-signs the contract. Again, rehires her boyfriend to Miami and Aruba and a cruise. Wade initially covered expenses for the October 2022 trip, totaling $5,200. So the judge confirms, makes a factual finding. Wade paid five grand. In December 2022, so we got October, December, the two flew to Miami for another cruise for which Fanny paid $1,400 for plane tickets and Wade purchased passage for the cruise along with other vacation related expenses, totaling $3,600. In March 2023, so again, October, December, March, the two then traveled to Belize. I think that was Wade's 50th birthday, where Wade covered resort and restaurant expenses in the amount of approximately $3,000. Then in May 2023, they traveled to Napa Valley, where Wade covered airfare, lodging, and Uber rides in the amount of $2,800. In addition, the two described taking a number of day-long road trips to Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, other parts of Georgia. They weren't doing anything. They weren't doing any other work. They were just traveling around. So they also admitted to dining out, this is McAfee writing, on multiple occasions and taking turns covering the bill. That's what they admitted to. That's what they testified to, taking turns. If you believe their testimony, which it's hard to believe anybody does. With seemingly full access to Wade's primary credit card statements, the defendants did not produce evidence of any further documentable expenses or gifts, nor were any revealed through the testimony. Okay, come on, judge. You know who had full access to Wade's primary credit card statements and bank records? Nathan Wade. What did he produce to corroborate any of his claims? Nothing. Neither did Fanny. And they've got a duty of candor to the court. So the defense, the judge is kind of, I think, over overextending to the defense this idea that they have seemingly full access. Like, come on, that's way overbroad there, judge. They got this by happenstance through Jocelyn Wade and the divorce. This whole thing was barely cracked open. It don't act like they had like Wade's, you know, login account. He could hop onto the Amex and see what's going on. And by the way, Nathan Wade also used Terrence Bradley's credit card, apparently for a trip. So this is BS, okay? There was money that was being used on other credit cards. Now let's see if he gets to that, but Terrence Bradley testified that Nathan Wade used swiped his card for what? A trip. Ashley Merchant got that out. So yeah, they didn't have access to Terrence Bradley's credit card or to Fannie Willis's credit card. So the judge is, you know, keeping the burden on them, but the the, gov the government, the prosecutor's office could have easily rebutted that and they didn't. Now in total, the defendants point to an aggregate documented benefit of at most approximately 12 grand to 15 grand in Fannie's favor. So the judge even admits 12,000 to 15,000 bucks, okay, to her benefit. And remember that the gift provisions that Fannie was supposed to report on was only $100. She was supposed to report any gift and Nathan Wade was a qualified person covered by that statute. Judge McAfee writes, Fannie and Wade, they testified that these expenditures were not meant as gifts. Yeah, yeah, because they can't define that. They don't even know what it means and not designed to benefit the DA. So can they use that defense? This was not designed as a drug transaction. This was not designed to benefit someone, right? This transaction for sale. It's crazy. There's two clear benefits. One, she's on a cruise on a vacation, indulging herself, probably getting pampered, drinking her gray goose. And number two, she had her boyfriend with her and she got to provide a forum for him to leave, right? If he's working, slaving away at his private office, he's got to deal with clients, phone calls, all this crap. All she does is just bring her boyfriend, right? DA and special counsel Wade, they're going on a meeting, leave him alone, right? So she not only like has the benefit of the consortium of her lover, much better to go with your boyfriend than it is to go alone, right, Fanny? And she also provides this new environment, this professional environment where he can get away apparently every other month and no one bothers them. So it was not designed to benefit Fanny. Clearly it was, clearly. Now both testified that Fanny regularly reimbursed Wade in cash, you know, very common. Fanny testified that if someone says it's going to be a G, she says, I'll give him a thousand. I give him a grand. If it's going to be a G, I'll give him a grand. No problem. And so if not reimbursed because she paid in cash, then Fanny covered a comparable or related expense. So you buy breakfast and lunch, I'll get dinner. Okay. Even Stevens. For example, Fanny testified that she reimbursed Wade in cash for the Aruba trip, which estimated she cost said around two grand and 
and that she gave him money for both, both cruises. She further claimed that she reimbursed Wade for the entirety of the Belize trip and that she paid for the Napa Valley excursions. And finally, while Wade could have bought meals in 2020, which totaled more than $100, she would also regularly pay for his meals. And 2020 is well before the relationship started, according to them. They said 2022. Why were they having lunch in 2020? So is he admitting that that relationship happened in 2020? Finally, while Wade could have bought meals in 2020, which totaled more than 100, maybe because that's on her disclosure form, she would also regularly pay for his meals. Well, that sounds like boyfriend-girlfriend material in 2020. Hopefully the judge recognizes that because they lied to you, judge, in their affidavit. They said their relationship started later in 22. All right. Now, such reimbursement, says Judge McAfee, and such a practice may be unusual, huh? and the lack of any documentary corroboration is understandably concerning. <laughs> Yet the testimony withstood direct contradiction. Yeah, because you can't refute it, right? Isn't that the beautiful thing about cash? Man, I hope all of those people being prosecuted for any illegal transaction in Fulton County are reading this one. No, we just transacted in cash. You can't track anything. Here's my alibi. You can't track it because it was all done in cash. No, we reimbursed. It was all done. So yet the testimony withstood direct contradiction. It was corroborated by other evidence, this judge. For example, her payment of airfare for two of the 2022 Miami trips. So he's like, see, she did reimburse him one time, so she probably reimbursed him all the other times. And it's unusual, but they can't prove that they didn't do it and was not so incredible as to be inherently unbelievable. Well, the problem, Judge, is that they don't have any credibility, all right? So yes, a credible person who was honest and didn't lie about when their relationship started and didn't try to threaten witnesses and try to cover this up by shifting Terrence Bradley's testimony and by having Gay Banks get phone calls from Nathan Wade's friend makes their credibility absolutely unbelievable, not inherently unbelievable. So however, as the DA herself acknowledged, no ledger exists, obviously, because it's fake. Other than a best guesstimate, there is no way to be certain that expenses were split completely evenly, and Fanny may well have received a net benefit of several hundred dollars. This is like pure speculation. She may have received a benefit of $15,000. We can both play that stupid game. Yeah, you're right, we don't know. Do you know why we don't know? Because Fanny and Nathan lied about it. They covered it up. And even if you say they didn't lie or cover it up, they still were dishonest in their divorce interrogatories and their public disclosure forms. It's dishonest. They filled out their forms as filled with lies. So, okay, judge, let's see. Despite this, after considering all the surrounding circumstances, the court finds that the evidence did not establish that Fanny's receipt of a material financial benefit as a result of her decision to hire and engage in a romantic relationship with Wade. So did not establish that there was a material financial benefit, which is just like, come on, guys, are you serious now? If you're going to try to take your significant other on five, four different official big trips and multiple different day trips, it's easier to do that if they don't have to ask their boss, who is making sure that they continue to get paid, they don't need to ask for permission, right? Because you're their boss. Fanny just says, yeah, you're good. Let's go. Rather than saying to somebody who's actually working, why aren't you in your office doing your job that you're getting paid to do? Now, simply put, says McAfee, the defendants have not presented sufficient evidence indicating that the expenses were not roughly evenly divided or that Fanny or currently was or currently remains greatly and pecuniarily interested in the prosecution. The judge is really making a narrow standard. He wants like money. Like, did Nathan Wade give Fannie Willis a big fat lottery check? Like, here you go, baby. Here's a check. Here you go. No, he didn't do that. But clearly, he went on a bunch of different trips that he would not have been able to go on at the cadence and the pace that he went on with her without this assignment. So that is just total cop out. Now, McAfee continues and he says, and much more important, the court finds based largely on Fannie's testimony that the evidence demonstrated that the financial gain flowing from her relationship with Wade was not a motivating factor on the part of Fannie's decision to indict and prosecute this case. Oh my gosh. While a general motive for more income can never be disregarded entirely, Fannie was not financially destitute throughout this time or in any great need. As she testified, her salary exceeds $200,000 per year without any indication of excessive expenses or debts. This is pathetic. Similarly, so Fannie had money, so she's not going to grift other money. So that's like a great defense for anybody who's ever been charged with any crime. I would never do that because I don't need that, right? Every shoplifting charge, why would I steal that? I already have one at home. Oh, I guess you already have one at home. I guess you didn't do this bad thing then. So the motive was clearly they had a whole book written about her. Okay, she was going to be this new leader of anti-Trump TDS main.
Mania going to elevate her profile and this would set her entire future up by prosecuting this case. So don't act like, you know, $17,000, I can see where the judge is going, like $17,000, $15,000 is just a small slice of the pie for someone who gets 200 grand a year. And she's not spending wildly. She's not at the casino blowing stuff on Grey Goose. She just likes Grey Goose in moderation, even though they go on four cruises. Now, of course, Fanny could show us that she would go on these cruises anyways, right? Fanny could walk us back through her timeline and tell us that she regularly goes on cruises. Nathan Wade and their new lover relationship didn't change her course of conduct. She's already been doing this for years, likes to go on cruises once every other month or trips every other month, which is amazing for a public servant, right? So Nathan came in, nothing changed or did it? Did these things start happening once he started getting this cash flow rolling? Now, similarly, the court finds that the defense have failed to demonstrate that Fanny's conduct has impacted or influenced the case to the defense's detriment. It's such a ridiculous, like he is overlooking the entire point. This case would not have been brought or prosecuted had it not gone to her lover. She took it to the governor, Roy Barnes, and said, will you please take this case? He says, you're crazy, get out of here. No one else wanted to touch it. So she says, how about you, honey? Then Nathan Wade gets the contract, meaning the inception, the birth of this entire case came from the Fannie and Wade corruption. The entire prosecution is to the defense's detriment. And the relationship of Fannie and Willis started in 2019 before he was appointed to begin the case in 2021, November. So while prejudice is not a required element for disqualification, it's relevant to considerations of due process and the defense request of remedy of complete dismissal. Well, they were clearly prejudiced. The entire bringing of the case has prejudiced every one of them. And the defendants argue that the financial arrangement created an incentive to prolong the case. But in fact, there is no indication that Fannie is interested in delaying anything. Indeed, the record is quite the contrary. Oh my gosh. But the relationship, before the relationship came to light, the state requested that trial begin less than six months after the indictment. Yeah, obviously. Judge, you're starting from the wrong starting point, my friend. The indictment was in August of 2023. But this case had been being jerked around for two years before that. So the timeline, obviously, is November 1, right? November 1 is where Nathan Wade's appointment came into this. That's the starting point. So November 1, 21, that's where we begin. This case has been meandering around for multiple years. Then the judge says that immediately after the indictment, around 8, 16, 23, now Fannie's suddenly saying, wow, we have to go to trial immediately. And the judge says, well, because she wanted six months, so from August 6, 16, 23, to you know, April, May-ish next year of the 24, the judge is saying that six months is very fast, right? Wow, the judge is saying six months from this starting point to the trial date. Wrong, judge. This started when Nathan Wade got appointed all the way back here. So don't give us this garbage like the state requested that trial. Nathan Wade got paid here, judge, not at the time of the indictment, and the judge knows that. Before the relationship came to light, the state requested that trial begin less than six months. Fanny's going very quickly. What? Soon thereafter, the state opposed severance of the objecting defendants who did not demand their statutory right to a speedy. This is all nonsense, okay? Because the judge started at the wrong starting point. Soon thereafter, the state opposed severance because again, that would have delayed past the election who did not demand their statutory right to a speedy trial. The state argued it only wanted to try the case once, assuming that the trial would have been affirmed and any necessary post-conviction appeals would come through. The state amended its proposed timeline in November 23 to request the trial commence less than one year after the return of the indictment, which came in August. Yeah, they have to now squeeze it in before the election. So the judge is using their election acceleration requests as evidence that this is not a grift. And even before the indictment, Fannie approved a grand jury presentment that included fewer defendants than the special purpose grand jury recommended. In some, okay, so now he's talking about some of these dates, but Nathan was getting paid for all of that. Now, in some, Fannie has not in any way acted in conformance with the theory that she arranged a financial scheme to enrich herself or endear herself to Wade. And nobody made that argument, endear herself to Wade. The argument was they hooked up at a CLE in 2019 by extending the duration of this prosecution or engaging in excessive litigation. This is total hogwash, man. This is a cope big time. Intentionally picked the wrong time. He started two years after this case actually started and then said, see, this case is going fast. It's a total cop out, man. Now, without sufficient evidence that Fannie acquired a personal stake in the prosecution, 
prostitution, which she did, Nathan wouldn't have gotten that money to go take her on cruises, or that her financial arrangements had any impact on the case, their claim of an actual conflict must be denied. Now, this finding, says the judge, which is so pathetic, is by no means an indication that the court condones this tremendous lapse in judgment. It kind of does. I mean, if you're not going to do anything about it. Or the unprofessional manner of D.A. Willis's testimony during the evidentiary hearing. It was unprofessional. She was screaming, had to get scolded. Rather, it is the judge's opinion that Georgia law does not permit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices. Okay. Even repeatedly. And it's the trial court's duty to confine itself to the relevant issues and applicable law properly brought before it. I disagree with this. I think it's bad, but the law doesn't allow me to do anything. It's just a bad choice. There's no actual conflict. Just go down the opposite hypothetical. If Nathan Wade said, listen, Fanny, baby, I love you, but I've reviewed this case. There's nothing we can do here. I'm competent. We need to not bring this indictment. That's it. There's no more billing. There's no remainder of the 21 contract. There's no 2022 contract. There's no 2023 contract. It's all gone. Nathan has to go back and slave away with Terrence Bradley. So clearly her lover got a gig that is a benefit to her. Now, other forums or sources of authority like the General Assembly, the Georgia Ethics Commissions, the Georgia Bar, the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, and the voters of Fulton County, they may offer feedback on any unanswered questions that linger. But those are not issues determinative to the defendant's motions alleging an actual conflict. And so we're going to allow other people to deal with the perjury and the witness tampering that happened in my courtroom. Tough judge, real nicely done. So he then talks about Judge McAfee, about the appearance of impropriety. He says, finding insufficient evidence of an actual conflict does not end the inquiry. Now our appellate courts have endorsed the application of an appearance of impropriety standard to state prosecutors, even without any explicit finding of an actual conflict. So you can use that standard. Let's see if how it applies. Now certainly a conflict of interest, this case, or the appearance of impropriety from a close personal relationship with the victim may be grounds for disqualification of a prosecutor, citing another case. Another one says a DA may not be compensated by means of a fee arrangement, which guarantees at least an appearance of a conflict of interest. Another case says a prosecutor's close personal relationship with the victim in a case may create at least the appearance of a prosecution that's unfairly based on private interest rather than one based on public interest. And another case granted a new trial after concluding that under such circumstances, there is at least an appearance of impropriety. So a lot of cases that seem to favor the defense. But McAfee says, the cases that I cited here that resulted in the disqualification of the DA did not hold that an actual conflict is a necessary prerequisite. So you don't even have to get to the upper echelon high standard of actual conflict. The state nevertheless argues that the facts presented suggested as much. And while that may be so in some instances, the opinions did not make that finding, and this court cannot ignore the explicit language of the Georgia Supreme Court and multiple opinions from the Georgia Court of Appeals. And further, while Davenport, that case, is the first instance this court can find where the exact phrase of, quote, appearance of impropriety is used to assess the disqualification of a state prosecutor, the reference to Caesar's wife in Nichols and the admonition against all temptation and suspicion in Galden demonstrate that the principle has long been endorsed in Georgia law. We don't like even the appearance of impropriety. And he also references us to this footnote, saying the appearance verbiage likely owes its lineage to Canon 9 of the Code of Professional Responsibility. The rules say a lawyer should avoid even the appearance of professional impropriety, which affects all aspects of an attorney's professional life. That rule's been criticized. Georgia eventually supplemented its professional code. Now, despite its removal as an explicit requirement, Georgia appellate courts continue to apply an appearance standard in both criminal and civil contexts. Okay, McAfee writes, now while formally undefined in Georgia precedent, an appearance of impropriety is generally considered, quote, conduct or status that would lead a reasonable person to think that the actor is behaving or will be inclined to behave inappropriately or wrongfully. So this comes from Black's Law Dictionary. It's an official dictionary that lawyers use and it's not racist, probably. But it says, conduct or status that would lead a reasonable person to think the actor is behaving inappropriately or wrongfully. Reasonable person, an objective standard. Judge says, so borrowing from federal judicial recusal standards, the judge says a reasonable person is not an uninformed member of the public with only a passing knowledge of the facts at hand. This must be the 
standard as otherwise, and this causal uninformed or misinformed observer might believe that Fannie must recuse herself merely because her father shares a last name with a co-defendant, right? So the reasonable person about whether someone should go or not says, nor is a reasonable person a person who's hypersensitive, you know, or unduly suspicious. Like, that's illegal, I've got to go. So without understanding the relevant legal standards or the judicial practice. So now we're trying to define what this reasonable person is. Now, the appearance standard has also been defined and regularly applied as part of the code of judicial conduct. They say the test for an appearance of impropriety is whether, ask ourselves, could the situation create in reasonable minds like ours, our perception that the judge or the person's ability to carry out their responsibilities with integrity, with impartiality, and with competence is impaired. If we applied that to Fanny and Nathan, we'd ask ourselves, did they act in a manner which would impair their ability to act with integrity, impartiality, or competence? Yes to all three. Now, in contrast, only an attorney's professional behavior is subject to scrutiny through disqualification, and nor is a private attorney held to the strict nonpartisan standards of a judge. So to say that an appearance standard of inappropriately holds prosecutors to the same ethical standards as judges is inaccurate, although the distinction is less apparent here as the conduct at issue involves intermingling the professional and personal life of the DA. McAfee continues, he says, all right, the appearance standards recognizes that even when no actual conflict exists, a perceived conflict in the reasonable eyes of the public threatens confidence in the legal system itself, right? When this danger goes uncorrected, it undermines the legitimacy and the moral force of our already weakest branch of government, which is a point we make here regularly. Okay, the legislative branch has the power of the purse. Congress can take and spend money. Very powerful. The executive branch, the presidency, has the ability to use the FBI or to prosecute a case, right? And do a bunch of other things to execute the law. The judiciary relies on its legitimacy. And if you have a judge that allows people to come into his courtroom and lie about their prior misconduct, that undermines the legitimacy and the moral force of our weakest branch of government. There is no other enforcement mechanism. The judiciary's judgment will be obeyed only so long as the public respects it. That's from the Federalist Papers. Now, that's interesting, right? When the court splits the baby, which is basically what we're doing here, we ask ourselves, is the judge trying to keep, you know, the judiciary's credibility intact? I don't buy it for a minute. Her lies, her dishonesty, Nathan's cover-up attempts, shatters the credibility of the court, much more than administering justice here would. But McAfee continues. He says, thus, it is sometimes an attorney, guiltless in any actual sense, nevertheless is required to stand aside for the sake of public confidence in the probity of the administration of justice. McAfee says this court finds that it can and indeed must consider the appearance of impropriety as a basis for Fanny's disqualification, especially in recognition of the critical role that the prosecutor plays in our justice system. And he says one final observation can be gleaned from a careful study of our appellate decisions applying this standard. When we apply this standard, the remedy can vary. Unlike an actual conflict, the finding of an appearance of impropriety does not automatically demand disqualification. Our Supreme Court has previously analyzed disqualification under an appearance standard in a civil case, and they used a continuum. They recognize that disqualification is not always the appropriate outcome. In that prior case, here's what the judge said. At the one end of the scale, where disqualification is always justified and indeed mandated, even when balanced against the client's right to choose his lawyer, the appearance of impropriety coupled with the conflict or jeopardy to a client is still justified. Now, in these instances, it's clear that the disqualification is necessary for the protection of the client. Somewhere in the middle of the continuum is the appearance of impropriety based on conduct on the part of the attorney. As discussed above, this generally has been found insufficient to outweigh the client's interest in counsel of choice. This is probably so because absent danger to the client, the nebulous interest of the public at large and the propriety of the bar of the lawyers of the law is not weighty enough to justify disqualification. And finally, at the opposite end of the continuum is the appearance of impropriety based on not on conduct, but on status alone. And that is insufficient grounds for disqualification. So interesting, he used the scale, as we talked about at the start, to try to disambiguate the different contexts that exist. Now, the Supreme Court further notes that disqualification due to an appearance of impropriety should rarely occur where there is no danger that the actual trial will not be tainted. In other words, sounds like materiality. Yeah, maybe it was bad, but it doesn't impact the underlying case. Here's another case, Second Circuit 1979, says when there is no claim that the trial will be tainted, appearance of impropriety is simply too slender a reed on which to rest disqualification order except in the 
rarest of cases. So you need a little bit more than that. Although the Court of Appeals found the existence of an appearance of impropriety, it noted that the appearance could be cured through screening the affected prosecutor from participation in the remainder of the case. And moreover, to ensure that no conflict of interest or appearance of one might develop, the DA took the prudent step of ordering the investigator to take no part in the investigation or the prosecution of this case. So the judge found this as a model and he's just going to run with it. He found this 1994 case called Billings. He's like, I love this. I'm just going to screen out the bad guy. So the cases indicate that a trial court can consider alternative solutions to cure the appearance of impropriety. Yeah, good luck with that judge. Nor would the finding of an appearance of impropriety on the part of Fanny herself, in contrast to an actual conflict, which in my opinion, she clearly has, necessarily result in the disqualification of the entire office. The DA in the other case, McLaughlin, was absolutely disqualified due to a personal interest. And as a result, assistant DAs that were appointed by the DA, they lacked any authority to proceed. Now, McLaughlin did not address an appearance standard and made a point to limit total disqualification to instances of absolute disqualification. When the appearance of a conflict exists, only the affected prosecutor, if they're elected or appointed, is affected. The individual prosecutor who has the conflict may be disqualified from participation, but not all the other prosecutors who work for him. So with these principles in mind, says the judge, the court finds that the record made at the evidentiary hearing established that Fanny's prosecution is encumbered by an appearance of impropriety. Okay, now this appearance is not created by mere status alone, but comes because of the specific conduct and impacts more than a mere nebulous public interest because it concerns a public prosecutor. Even if the romantic relationship began after Wade's initial contract in November, Fanny chose to continue supervising and paying Wade while maintaining that relationship. She further allowed the regular and the loose exchange of money between them without any exact or verifiable measure of reconciliation. A lot of exchanges there. This lack of confirmed financial split creates the possibility and the appearance of Fanny's benefit, albeit non-materially, from a contract whose award lay solely within her purview and policing. Wow. Most importantly, were the case allowed to proceed unchanged, the prima facie concerns, like the facial concerns of just having these two together, raised by the defense would persist. Yeah, we even were commenting on it when she was there sitting next to him at the bench. They had to separate themselves. They had two chairs in between them because it would have looked really weird if they were leaning over one another. As Fanny testified, her relationship with Wade has only cemented after these motions and she said our relationship is quote, stronger than ever. Wade's patently unpersuasive explanation for the inaccurate interrogatories, judge those are called lies, okay? Patently unpersuasive. A lie, a cover-up. For the inaccurate interrogatories he submitted in his pending divorce case indicates a willingness on his part to wrongly conceal his relationship with Fanny. Again, a lie. There is no explanation. He lied on the interrogatories, judge, and then lied about lying on the interrogatories. Now, as the cases move forward, reasonable members of the public could easily be left to wonder whether the financial exchanges have continued resulting in some form of benefit to Fanny. That's right. Reasonable members could. Or even when the romantic relationship has resumed. Whether it has resumed. Probably has. But put differently, an outsider could reasonably think that Fanny is not exercising her independent professional judgment totally free of any compromising influences. And so Judge McAfee says, as long as Wade remains on the case, this unnecessary perception will persist. Says the testimony introduced, including of DA, Fanny, and Wade, did not put these concerns to rest. During argument, the defense focused largely pivoted from the financial concerns to disproving the testimony of Fanny, namely that her romantic relationship actually predated the hiring of Wade. On that front, the court makes a few brief observations. First, the court finds itself unable to place any stock in the testimony of Terrence Bradley. So he's not credible. No stock. His inconsistencies, his demeanor, his generally non-responsive effort answers left far too brittle a foundation upon 
on to build any conclusions other than he's helping Fanny cover up. While prior inconsistent statements can be considered as substantive evidence under Georgia law, which are the text message, Bradley's impeachment by text message did not establish the basis for which he claimed such sweeping knowledge of Wade's personal affairs. So he just says, yeah, they had a relationship, but he didn't say how he knew that they had a relationship. And the judge says, well, we don't know. There's no foundation. He says, for that reason, the court finds it unnecessary to reopen evidence to consider the testimony of the prosecutor or Manny Aurora as proffered by defendants Schaefer and Latham respectively. So no law professor who says that Terrence Bradley or no testimony from the prosecutor. Now, the prosecutor also confirmed that the relationship started before Fannie and Nathan Wade lied about it in 2022. They say it started in 2019. Terrence Bradley told both of them that. But Cindy Yeager says she heard Fannie call Terrence Bradley and say they're coming after us. You don't have to say anything. It might be unnecessary to hear from Cindy about what Terrence Bradley said because Terrence Bradley told her the same thing, told Manny the same thing, told Ashley the same thing, that there was a relationship that started in 2019. Cindy wouldn't add any more to that. So we don't need to hear more about that. That's fine. But Cindy would tell that Fanny was calling Terrence to shut him up, which implicates her in the sanctity of the very hearing. The judge just fails to mention that. Now, in addition, while the testimony of Robin Yurdy raised doubts about the state's assertions, it ultimately lacked context and detail. Even after considering the proffered cell phone testimony from the defense and Trump, along with the entirety of the other evidence, neither side was able to conclusively establish by a preponderance of the evidence when the relationship evolved into a romantic one. Oh my gosh. Preponderance of the evidence is 51% or not. It's a low standard. More likely than not. Is it more likely than not that they had a romantic relationship when Fanny would call him at 1130 at night, he'd get in the car, go over there, do the indictment business, go back home, say, good to see you, baby. I'm home safe. And all of the other witnesses, clearly it's over 51%. It was romantic. So the judge is not going to address their perjury because he's going to say, I can't tell when the relationship started. I don't know when it started. I don't know. So there is no lie because he can't figure it out, right? He saves himself having to make a very tough decision. I don't know when the relationship started. Robin Yurdy's not that credible. And all of the other evidence is not even 51% likely. You be the judge and jurors on that one, okay? 51%, give me a break. Doesn't even meet preponderance of the evidence. Yeah, right. He says, however, an odor of mendacity remains. It does stink. That's true, judge. A lot stinks there in Fulton. The court is not under an obligation to ferret out every instance of potential dishonesty from each witness or defendant ever presented in open court. No one was asking you to do that, judge. Thanks for setting a standard that's impossible to reach and then measuring yourself against that and then blaming us for holding you to that standard. Such an expectation would mean an end to the efficient disposition of criminal and civil proceedings. No one's asking you to do that. Like You don't have to get into Yurdy and Terrence and all. It's Fanny. Did she lie? She's the DA. Yet reasonable questions about whether Fanny and her hand selected lead Wade reasonable questions about whether her and Wade testified untruthfully about the timing of their relationship further underpin the finding of an appearance of impropriety and the need to make proportional efforts to cure it. Reasonable questions about whether they lied. Now ultimately dismissal of the indictment says McAfee is not the appropriate remedy to adequately dissipate the financial cloud of impropriety and potential untruthfulness here saying referencing other cases that this dismissal of an indictment is an extreme sanction used only sparingly as a remedy for unlawful government conduct. There has not been a showing that the defense's due process rights have been violated or that the issues involved prejudice the defendants in any way. Absolutely ridiculous. The indictment is unlawful. There was a corrupt relationship between the two of them that led to the birth of this indictment. The entire prosecution prejudices the defense. The entire case is a due process right violation. Nor is this qualification of a constitutional officer like Fannie necessary when a less drastic and sufficiently remedial option is available. What a cop. The court therefore concludes that the prosecution of this case cannot proceed until the state selects one of two options. The district attorney may choose to step aside along with her whole office and refer the prosecution to the prosecuting attorney's counsel for reassignment. Fannie's obviously not going to do that. Or alternatively, Nathan Wade can withdraw allowing Fanny, the defendants, and the public to move forward without his presence or the remuneration distracting from and potentially compromising the merits of the case. So he's basically acknowledging, right, that Fanny was bad and
and Nathan was bad, but only one of them has to go. We can keep one bad, lying, dishonest prosecutor, but you can't have two. You can have one, but not two. If you try to get two of them in here, that's really bad. But if only one of you is lying and dishonest, well, we can live with that. But Fanny, you now have to choose who stays on the island or who goes. That's the judge's solution. So he's acknowledging there's a pretty serious problem. Sounds like if there is no actual conflict and there's only the appearance, apparently you find Fanny to be credible because you couldn't put a start date on the relationship. Then why should there be any removal? Because of the odor? Now, okay, here's the judge. He says, also talk about forensic misconduct. The Georgia Supreme Court also recognizes forensic misconduct or improper comment by the state as grounds for disqualification. One example of such forensic misconduct is, quote, expression by the prosecuting attorney of his personal belief in the defendant's guilt. Another case found that a pretrial public comment by a prosecutor that a conviction would be, quote, the right result constituted an impermissible but not disqualifying expression of the opinion about the merits of the case. The right result. Now, another case was overruled on other grounds. Now, as guidance, Williams instructs the trial court, says the judge should, quote, take into consideration whether the remarks, like Fanny's, were part of a calculated plan, evincing a design to prejudice the defense in the minds of the jurors, and whether such remarks were inadvertent utterances. So balance these things out. Williams also notes that while a prosecutor's comments may be considered improper, they must be egregiously improper as to justify disqualification. McAfee continues, saying this court has not located, nor has been provided with, a single additional case exploring the relevant standards for forensic misconduct, or an opinion that actually resulted in a disqualification under Georgia law. And so left unexplored, therefore, is how other examples of forensic misconduct can manifest, such as whether the statements that stop short of commenting on the guilt can be disqualifying, nor has it been decided if some showing of prejudice is required, and how a trial court should go about determining whether that prejudice exists. Nor is it clear whether the analysis differs depending on the pretrial posture of the case. There's no standards for me to apply here, so unmoored from precedent, the court feels confined to the boundaries of Williams and restricts the application of the facts here to its limited holding. Saying Trump and the defense and Roman and Merchant, they have exhaustively documented every public comment made by Fannie about this case. They've done that in their motions and in their filings, and many of these have already been addressed through a pretrial challenge made on similar grounds brought by Trump and Latham previously. And so this court incorporates and adopts the sound reasoning of Judge McBurney and finds that the comments made by Fannie prior to July 31st did not amount to disqualifying misconduct, saying public comments about the need for and the importance of the investigation fall far short of bias explicit that must be found to remove them. And similarly, more recent comments describing the charges in the indictment, the procedural posture of the case, the office's conviction rates, the personal behind the scenes anecdotes are not disqualifying. Fanny can do whatever she wants, whenever she wants, all the time with no consequences. This includes Fanny's unorthodox decision to make on the record comments and authorize members of her staff to do the same. Now the author's intent on publishing a book about the grand jury investigation during the pendency of the case, that's all her prerogative. And those decisions may have ancillary prejudicial effects yet to be realized, but the comments do not rise to the level of disqualification under the case law and so I can't boot her for that. Now, the same cannot be so easily said of Fanny's prepared speech before the church on January. In these public and televised comments, Fanny complained that a Fulton County commissioner and, quote, so many others questioned her decision to hire Wade. When referring to her detractors throughout the speech, she frequently utilized the plural called they. Now, the state says the speech was not aimed at any of the defendants. Yeah, right. Judge says maybe so, but maybe not. Therein lies the danger of public comment by a prosecuting attorney by including a reference to quote so many others on the heels of Roman's motion which instigated the entire controversy Fanny left that question open for the public the court finds after considering the statement as a whole under all the circumstances surrounding its issuance that Fanny's speech did include Michael Roman and his counsel, whether it was intentional or not. McAfee says it's also worth noting is that there may be an issue of standing for the other five defendants' challenge of this speech. Although counsel for Trump expressed in open court the possibility that he would join the motion after his own investigation, each defendant only formally joined Roman's motions challenging the hiring of Wade after the speech had been made. Saying more at issue, McAfee continues, instead of attributing the 
criticism to a criminal accused general aversion to being convicted and going to jail, Fannie ascribed the effort as motivated by, quote, playing the race card. She went on to frequently refer to Wade as, quote, a black man, while her other unchallenged special prosecutors were labeled one white woman and one white man, both of whom she didn't sleep with. Racist. Now, the effect of this speech was to cast racial aspersions at the indicted defendant's decisions to file this motion. Clearly. However, but the speech did not specifically mention any defendant by name. So, although not improvised or inadvertent, it also did not address the merits of the indicted offenses in an effort to move the trial itself or the court of public opinion. So it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. Nor did it disclose sensitive or confidential evidence that has yet to be revealed or admitted at trial. And in addition, the case is too far removed from the jury to establish a permanent taint of the jury pool. What? As best it can divine, under the sole direction of Williams, the court cannot find that the speech crossed the line to the point where the defendants have been denied the opportunity to a fundamentally fair trial. She can go out in church, call them racists in nationally publicized speeches, say that she's on the side of God, they are not, and that she's on the right side of justice as a prosecutor, and that it requires her disqualification. He says, there's nothing I can find in the law that says I can throw you out. But the judge provides some reassurance here. But it was still legally improper. Mm -hmm. Providing this type of public comment creates dangerous waters for the DA to wade further into. The time may well have arrived for an order preventing the state from mentioning the case in any public forum to prevent prejudicial pretrial publicity. But that's not the motion before us today. And so the defense motions demanding disqualification and dismissal because she called them racist and demons opposed to God, that is denied from Judge McAfee. Now, as we come to the close of his order, he says the defendants invoke a range of other constitutional, statutory, and county provisions that support disqualifying Fannie, like the trustee clause, and various provisions about Fannie violating her disclosure and hiring violations under Georgia law. Now, as to the latter, McAfee says a district attorney may appoint private attorneys to assist with criminal cases independent of any specific statutory authorization. This statute does not place limitations on the appointment of a Wade to work on a specific case as opposed to county approval of a general employee. And so while Wade's contract did not limit his work to any particular case, the testimony established as much, and the defense have not produced any evidence demonstrating that his work ever expanded beyond his prosecution and so further, to the extent that the defense argues that the circumstances of Wade's loyalty oath create independent grounds for disqualification, the court incorporates our previous order and denies that as well. Now, as for the remaining provisions and arguments, the court has not been presented with any authority that such violations, even if proven, amount to an actual conflict of interest, nor that an appearance of impropriety can apply to any instance of inappropriate or wrongful behavior. In each case applying the appearance standard, the impropriety was connected in some way to an allegation of potential and previously recognized actual conflict. And so he says, in a separate motion adopting the arguments of her co-defendants, defendant Kathy Latham presents an additional theory. She asserts the right to call the DA as a witness at trial to examine her biases towards the defense, being that she brought a motivated prosecution. Now, accepting the sole citation raised in support from this other case that allows the impeachment of a prosecutor for improper motives, it requires ignorance of the opinion surrounding context. If you actually read the case and the authority upon which it relies and not simply quote the head note, it reveals the Court of Appeals antiquated use of the word prosecutor referred not to the legal officer handling the case, but rather the main witness for the state. So they got the case wrong. Defendant Latham asserts a claim accurately categorized as one of selective prosecution, and SCOTUS has recognized that some claims are not a defense on the merits to any of the criminal charges. So instead, a claim of selective prosecution must be brought in the form of a motion asking the court to exercise its judicial power on equal protection grounds. So lacking such a showing there and any foundation in the law or in the rules of evidence, the motion therefore is denied. Now, in conclusion, McAfee says whether this case ends in convictions, acquittals, or something in between, the result should be one that instills confidence in the process. Well, sorry, Judge, you just blew that. A reasonable observer unburdened by partisan blinders should believe the law was impartially applied. None of us do. And those accused of crimes had a fair opportunity to present their defenses. And that any verdict was based on our criminal justice system's best efforts, yeah, at ascertaining the truth. Any distractions that detract from these goals, if remedial under the law, should be proportionally addressed. After consideration of the record established on these motions, the court finds the allegations 
allegations and evidence legally insufficient to support a finding of an actual conflict of interest, which is wild. However, the appearance of impropriety remains and must be handled as previously outlined before the prosecution can proceed. The defendant's motions are therefore granted in part and denied in part. Judge McAfee, Superior Court, Fulton County, Atlanta Judicial Circuit. So pretty blinded opinion, something I think that is weak. I think the judge has willful blinders on. He is putting his fingers in his ears. La, 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 la. I don't know what happened here. I can't decide a bunch of this stuff. And it's kind of even Stevens. We're going to put Fannie Willis and give her a bunch of credibility, even though we know that she doesn't have any credibility. We're going to put her on even par with other defendants, witnesses, and call it a wash, but not really call it a wash. They're both bad, but only one of them is bad enough that they need to go. We can live and remain with one bad prosecutor. And so very, very weak and very disappointing, actually. I don't know what kind of pressures came down to bear upon this judge in the court of public opinion or whether he thinks this is going to save him or whether this will cause Robert Patillo or his other contenders to drop out and whether he's trying to secure his position there, whether he's trying to just live in Fulton County. He's got a three-year-old and a five-year-old and he may not want to deal with the repercussions there, but it is absolutely blind to everything that we saw and what happened in his courtroom, which were cover-ups and lies were being spread about directly to his face and he's allowing it to continue. We did have some reaction from Steve Sadow. He already came out. He posted an update. Here's what he says. He says, the lead defense counsel for Trump issues the following statement. Trump's defense attorney Sadow says, while respecting the court's decision, we believe that it did not afford appropriate significance to the prosecutorial misconduct of Willis and Wade, including the financial benefits, testifying untruthfully about when their personal relationship began, as well as Willis's extrajudicial MLK church speech, where she played the race card and falsely accused the defendants and their counsel of racism. We will use all options available as we continue to fight to end this case, which should never have been brought in the first place. So we've got him. Phil Holloway, of course, has broken some news on this and been very involved in the Georgia case. He says the Fannie Willis order is ridiculous. Okay, so Wade has to go. That's it. Willis can stay. No weight was given to Yurdy, who saw them hugging and kissing. Totally unbelievable. Says, sadly, this reflects the political reality now that the judge has two opponents in the election to be held in May. He inflicted no real damage to Fannie, and this keeps her political machine from turning on him at a time when he can't afford that. It might be a foregone conclusion he might lose anyways. Phil says, no need to hear from Cindy Yeager, the prosecutor, who says she has personal knowledge of witness tampering. Nope, just mind-bogglingly stupid, and this order is ridiculously illogical. It is, because it's obviously bad. Someone needs to go, but if Nathan needs to go, doesn't that also implicate Fannie's judgment and she was a part of that? So you just separate them and now her judgment is suddenly like beyond reproach? No, that's not how it works. Thank you.